<laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the program. My name is Monica Solina Saunders. I'm an associate professor in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and I'm the coordinator of this program titled Immigration Policies and Practices in the Land of the Free. Are we doing the best we can? We're very excited today. Um, we have uh, um, a host, we have a moderator and panelist, uh, but we also have uh, our special guest, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, um, Dr. Vicky Roman Lagunas, who is going to do the, re the main remarks uh, um, for this event. Thank you, Vicky. Cool, thanks for inviting me. I have just a couple, oh my goodness, I was younger then. Um, I have just a couple of things I wanted to say and I'd like the panelists to take over. But when Monica reached out to me, my heart jumped up because immigration is, and immigration policy is really part of my academic training, certainly as a Latin Americanist, right? So that's the first piece of me. I had a little conversation with Chris about this, Chris Young, and actually it might have become part of my academic interest because of my personal interests. And I just wanna give you a two minute thing of why my heart jumped up so high. And I'm so grateful for you for putting this together, Monica. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. Um, so I, my last name is Murphy. It, you know, I got Roman Lagunas as an older person, but um, I was born Vicky or Victoria Ann Murphy. All of my grandparents except one came over on the boat at separate times in the 20s. And um, they were undocumented immigrants until um, just a few years before each of them died, right? So we, we dealt with the undocumented Irish immigrants certainly, but the whole not being able to vote, not having a voice, that when they were in their 60s, they determined that this was important to them, important enough to them to, to, to move forward. And the policies allowed it much more in those years. I also grew up in New York. And so every year our field trips were to the um, Statue of Liberty. We took, got the boat and went to the Statue of Liberty. And um, in our chorus, we sang, give me your tired, your poor, right? So, so these are also part of my early on trainings, elementary school on learning about immigration from my grandparents and learning about our history in the United States. Um, Later on, I met my husband, who was a refugee from a dictatorship in South America. And so um, he got out without declaring refugee status. He was on the death list in Chile. And um, luckily, he got into a graduate program, which is where we meet met in the United States. So dealing with not being able to go home, the whole psychological trauma of being an immigrant of not having a home. As you're an immigrant, you realize, at least he realized, and our friends talked about, he wasn't really Chilean anymore and he never felt really American. Um, he did become a citizen that was appropriate, but he never gave his Chileanness up, which is, um, it's a psychological state. And finally, one little thing, I, I, you know, the personal and the politics, of course, always mix. In the 80s, my husband and I um, were, um, we were the last step in the Underground Railroad in Minnesota for folks um, who were from Central America and they had their, their documents to get into Canada. They just didn't have documents to be in the United States. And they, the, these folks stayed in our home and, and we got them finally up to the Canadian, we didn't, one of the area priests did, got them to the Canadian border. So this is personal, political, and I'm really excited. And thank you for doing this again. And I'm looking forward to today. Thank you so much, Vicky. This is a really um, amazing story. And it, um, it's heartwarming. Um, and knowing that you are in that position today is, uh, to me, means a lot. It's a great example for everybody. Thank you, Vicky. 
Next in this program, um, we have our host. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, uh, Professor Susan Zinner. Dr. Zinner is a professor in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Um, and um, she does a lot of work with, uh, um, in ethics. And I actually, instead of uh, telling you about Susan, I'm going to let her introduce herself. And after the introduction, she will be um, moving on with the program. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome, Monica. Thanks. Uh, so welcome to everybody. Um, I'll just introduce myself uh, very quickly. I'm a professor in SPIA along with Monica and uh, also with uh, Chris Young, who will be one of our panelists. My area of interest is bioethics. I'm especially interested in pediatric and vulnerable populations, and my background is law. Um, I'm going to uh, ask the uh, speakers to briefly introduce themselves, um, beginning with uh, our primary speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Marone of Bloomington. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Michael Maroney and I'm a Bloomington uh, professor in the School of Business and I teach uh, also in the LAMP program, which is the Liberal Arts Management Program. Uh, I am a lawyer by training and uh, immigration law was my specialty, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit about that in a minute. First, I just want to thank thank you all for having this event. I there's there's uh, no no topic that's more near and dear to my heart than talking about uh, immigration, uh, just because I've had so many experiences uh, with immigrants helping them get to this country, and and I've been th that that has been brought a lot of meaning to to, to my life. Um, so it's wonderful that you're having this event. So uh, in terms of my, my early career, I worked at a place called Casa de Proyecto Libertad, which was down on the, uh, in Harlingen, Texas, right, right near the Mexican border. And uh, primary work there was uh, helping people get out of detention and to families where they could have fair hearings in immigration courts or representing people in courts. That was the other thing I did. Then I moved to Philadelphia and worked at Catholic Social Services and ran their immigration program for a few years. Uh, and then I ended up at IU and I had a sol solo practice, primarily going to immigration court um, up, up in Chicago, uh, third, fifth and seventh circuits representing uh, primarily asylum uh, applicants. And um, I also re did a lot of family reunification. So um, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you. And so everyone knows um, what we're planning for the presentation. Uh, Michael will be speaking um, probably about for half the presentation on immigration issues and his background and addressing some questions afterwards. And then the second half of the program will involve uh, faculty at IUN and the faculty uh, panelist session will be moderated by Mr. Joe gomez Dagel, IUN uh, SPIA adjunct faculty. So I'm gonna ask Joe to briefly introduce himself. But Joe, Joe, I think you're uh, muted. That's one thing I forgot, sorry about that. Thank you very much uh, for the entire panel and every our listening audience. Um, I'm very proud and honored to be part of uh, moderating this event and hopefully be part of it for the future. I've been, uh, I'm an immigrant myself, came here when I was nine years old with my family in uh, 1959. And uh, I guess that's aging myself, but uh, we didn't know a word of English at that time. I've actually lived in Northwest Indiana and then from there went to University of Vietnam where I served two tours, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And then I came back and uh, basically judged the We The People program I've sat and I was naturalized in 1978 after serving in Vietnam, which is a wonderful, beautiful moment. It's very dear to me. And I've attended many, many naturalization uh, events that I've actually spoken to. And that's a very heartwarming event in Indianapolis, over 700. And you can see the anxiety, the, their, their cheerfulness. So I'm very much involved with this and I love it. So I'll leave it at that. Let's go with the next one. Okay, thank you. Our panelists include Dr. Anita Benna, from IUN's Department of Education or School of Education. Uh, Dr. Bennett, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much for this opportunity. 
I would like to share a little bit. I'm an associate professor of science education in the School of Ed at IU Northwest. I've taught elementary school for 20 years and I've been working in college and universities for the last 16 years. My research centers on STEM fields, STEM education, and professional development for teachers in elementary, middle, and high schools. This research and my teaching has led me to be in the elementary to high school classrooms since 1982. So I'm honored to be here and to share with you some information about educational psychology and the psychological effects of immigration on us children and families. Thank you. Thank you. Next panelist is Dr. Ellen Zarletta uh, from SPIA and CURE at IU Northwest. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to be here with everyone. A little bit of background on myself. As Susan said, I'm a faculty member professor in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and I am also director of IU Northwest Center for Urban and Regional Excellence. If you're not familiar with the center, it is our community engagement center, and we serve as a liaison between the university and the community. And so we have um, worked on many of the public policy issues with with our faculty members and community partners and are excited to be a part of this event. My background, I'm an economist um, and an attorney. And so I'm gonna be sharing a little bit today um, with you about the contributions of immigrants to the economy, dispelling some myths and also talking about the relationship between immigration and economic justice issues. So thanks. Thank you. And our final panelist is Dr. Chris Young the interim director of SPIA at IU Northwest and also from the Department of History. Thank you, Susan. So as uh, Susan had just mentioned, I'm the interim director of SPIA and I am an early Americanist and I'm particularly interested in the political culture of the early American Republic. And thank you, Monica, for organizing this event. Okay, Absolutely, so my pleasure. And uh, Susan, I want to say before we start with Michael's presentation that we really strongly encourage all the attendees to place their comments or questions or whichever, doesn't matter, uh, but whatever they want to say in the Q&A so that I'll be monitoring uh, the Q&A and uh, we will address those questions. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. And now we can move on to uh, the main presentation, Dr. Maroni. Hi, so first thing I wanna do is just uh, thank everybody for sending in, thank all the students who sent in questions. Um, I pretty much covered a lot, of the, a lot of this background and some of it will come up um, further in, 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 during the presentation. Um, probably one thing that's worth mentioning is just in the, that little bottom paragraph there, I have uh, worked with people from over 90 countries and had over a thousand clients uh, primarily in uh, refugee asylum, family reunification, um, defending people in deportation, what's now called removal proceedings, and also working with people for naturalization cases. So in the, for the sake of having time to answer questions, uh, I, I think that that's probably good for that. <laughs> Let's go to those questions. They're great. Okay, so can you please clarify the difference Oh, I'm sorry, let me begin with the first question. Yeah. Uh, can you please describe a case of an immigrant or immigrant family you represented and tell us why you chose this case? So this was actually a, an extremely hard question for me to answer because um, when you work with people who are in asylum situations or who have been separated from their families for a long time, you remember them. You remember them very well. You remember their stories. And so uh, I had to actually put aside the story that I usually tell because it doesn't encapsulate as much of the issues that arise in, in a typical uh, long-term relationship with an with a immigrant client. So I'm, this is a longer-term relationship I had with the client, uh, lasted 20 years. So it goes like this. Uh, my client was from Afghanistan, arrived in the United States legally uh, with, with the visa, but he was afraid, and he had, his, he had his wife and two children with him. He was afraid to return to Afghanistan because the uh, Taliban was uh, getting a lot of power at that time. And uh, he was from a, a group that was um, opposed to the Taliban, and he was fairly well known. Um, 
So he asked me to represent him in an asylum case. I did so. And, and he, in his asylum case, he ended up winning asylum. What that means is that a year later, you're able to apply for a green card. So I represented him in that and him and his whole family. Then three years after that, you're able to apply for citizenship. Now, here's what happened in this case. Everything moved really smoothly for his wife and children. We applied for the, applied for the green card. They get their green card in about a year or two. There's background checks. It takes a little while. Then they wait, they get their citizenship. So this is about 2006 or seven. They've already been here eight years by that time because the, 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 these background checks take time. Meanwhile, the, the, the main client, um, he doesn't even have his green card. And we keep getting news that the, back from immigration, whenever we send in a query, um, we're, this case is stalled due to the background check, FBI background check. We got Congress, uh, Congress person involved from Indianapolis. And the word was, and this was about 2013, they're, they're planning on denying his case. So I told him, you just need to sit back and wait. And, and, and we don't want to push on him if they're planning on denying your case. Well, about a year later, his case was approved. So he gets his green card in 2014, and he doesn't apply for citizenship until he's eligible 2017. So this is a client that I had, uh, you know, that I paid attention to, that I got to know over a 20-year period, something that really should have taken probably about six years, but for a system that um, puts in lots of roadblocks for people, particularly people from, from certain countries and from, that, that are of certain religions. So that, that case, I, I'm bringing that up because it, it, has, it brings in a lot of facets of what's going on in our immigration system. Okay. Um, so can you please clarify the difference among the different groups of immigrants? And there was a question raised just about this in chat uh, just now, uh, including terms like asylum seeker, illegal immigrants, refugees, legal immigrants, uh, aliens, and others. Yeah, this, this is a, actually, I, I was joking yesterday when we were getting ready for this, they, they, they teach whole, like, whole classes on this in law school. So I'm going to boil this down in three minutes for you, basically. Um, you have, bas basically, to be an immigrant to the United States, you have to get approval to immigrate here. And, 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 and there's even another category, we call it the non-immigrants. So a lot of our students at, at, our, at our universities would be non-immigrants, and you have to get approval for that, too. So people who are coming to the United States are the legal process are getting approval either as immigrants to come to the United States or as non-immigrants to come to the United States. Okay. Now things break down a little bit here when we start talking about refugees and asylees and what do we mean by legal immigrant? What do we mean by illegal immigrant? So the first thing I would say is the term illegal immigrant is not in the United States statute. Let that sink in. What the United States statutes uh, uh, defines is what is an alien. It tells you what an immigrant is. It has all these non-immigrant classifications. Um, the term illegal alien first came into being in around the 1930s, and it was a creation of the media. It was, uh, I think, first in the New York Times, and, and some people latched onto that. It did not ever show up at all in immigration law until it showed up in particular titles of sections in the law where they use the word illegal alien. There's like two or three sections of the law where they do that. But the title of the section is not the law. You don't make any decision based on what the title of the section says. So it's still not actually in the law as we tend to think of it. So there's more of a common understanding of what an illegal immigrant is or an illegal alien is. Um, and, and basically it's someone who is out of status or undocumented in the United States. Um, I don't like to use the term personally because I find it inflammatory. Um, I don't believe that you define people by in that, in that way, shape or form or most of us would be illegal somethings. Um, so now refugees and asylees, again, complicated. Um, I'm doing okay though on time. So I'm going to go down, the, down this rabbit hole a little bit. Refugees and asylees are people who are afraid to live in their home country. Okay. So we heard, we heard Vicki mention this about her husband. He had a route of getting here, which meant he did not have to be a refugee. 
he was able to come through, uh, it sounds like a non-immigrant status and then that, and then, then transferred to an immigrant status, I'm guessing, but that's pretty common. Um, refugees are people who are afraid to go to their home country, but they apply to come to the United States through the United Nations. And once the United Nations identifies someone as a refugee, then, there, then countries all around the world have preferences for refugees that they will resettle to their country. So they're coming here legally to the United States completely 100% legally. It's a process that, that, that is you know, run by the United Nations and then the United States Department of the United States State Department gets involved and, that, and then there's a whole uh, refugee resettlement program. Uh, when I worked in Philadelphia, my part of the program that I supervised was migration. The other part was refugee resettlement. And it was pretty big. Asylees are people who are in the country and you can become a, an asylee. You still have to prove you're a refugee. Basically. You have to prove the same thing. You're afraid to go back to your home country, but you can do it either because you've been put in um, removal proceedings and you prove to a judge that you're a refugee or when you're here, like the client I just described earlier, he was in legal status and he did an asylum application. I went up to Chicago, uh, LaSalle Street, uh, where the asylum office is and uh, represented him in his case. And um, so he, he, he completely moved here in legal status and became an asylum legal status, was never out of status. Um, so he was never what even in general we would call an illegal immigrant, but people, people lump refugees and asylees with illegal, uh, illegal immigrants, illegal aliens, they, they, all the time. And it's, uh, it's a very highly vetted process. Um, people who achieve status in this way should never be referred to in that way. In fact, they, 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 deserve, um, they deserve empathy because they're coming from very difficult circumstances. Did I hit all of them? I think I hit all of them. Okay, thank you. So who are the people currently seeking asylum in the United States and why do they want to come here? This is a, this is a, a, a great question. Um, and so what I want to do here is I want to grab the screen because this is a really cool resource that, 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 that you can use. Um, this is called Refugee Project. Do you see this dark screen or dark screen? Well, when I click on it, you can see over here, we've got 20 million recognized refugees in the world now by the United Nations. If I want to see what's going on in the United States, I just click on the U.S. Right now in the United States, we have 307, 823,000 recognized refugees. These are not asylees, these are refugees, okay? So we can drill down uh, on this and see where people are coming from. And it, what's also cool is you can see by year how this number changes. So at, from 17 to 18, we added 26,000. We can go back further uh, and see, we added about 16,000 uh, refugees in, the, in, in that year. Um, it, we can also drill down a little bit further and see, let me see if I can do this, explore data, yeah. We can see the main countries of origin for the refugees in the United States, currently in the United States. So China by far has the highest number right now, Haiti, El Salvador. Now, again, this system is different than asylum. So when, if I want to go to asylum, I would go to, um, I could get this annual report from D the Department of Homeland Security and I can get all sorts of great statistics here. So uh, remember I, I said, uh, I described a situation where people come legally to the United States and then they apply for asylum uh, without being in deportation procedures. That's what we call affirmative asylum. Defensive asylum is when you're actually in deportation proceedings. Well, this tells you the grants for the last few years. Um, and what we see here is that the People's Republic of China has the most number of people who have received asylum in the last few years and followed by Venezuela, El Salvador, Guatemala, India. Um, we could also go down and they break it down for you, affirmative asylum cases and defensive asylum cases. And if you keep drilling down, you can see, um, Oh, we'll go the other direction. I'm sorry. We can see defensive asylum cases received. So these were people that were in deportation proceedings or removal proceedings who ended up applying for asylum. And you see a lot of people from Guatemala, 
Honduras, Mexico, El Salvador, um, uh, applying for asylum. So uh, between the mix, you know, you can get you can get your top ten. You know, and you're looking at you're looking at China, Venezuela, Guatemala, Honduras, um, El Salvador, uh, e even Nicaragua is on the list. Cuba. Um, so that 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 that's uh, basically where we're seeing people applying for asylum. That those are those are the current countries. So we, I can give back the screen now, Monica. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I just uh, want to remind everybody who is attending the program that uh, these terms, illegal immigrant or Ill illegal alien, this is not by choice uh, of anyone. Uh, are you uh, uh, Indiana University Northwest or are you in general? Um, we don't use these terms. However, these questions uh, we are created uh, by volunteer students who are interested in the topic and do not know um, how to um, correctly address these terms. I think it's uh, really important to um, recognize that they show being brave about asking these questions. Thank you. Our next question is, what are the differences in numbers between asylum seekers in the U.S. and in other countries? And this one will probably surprise people. This one will probably surprise people. And I'm going to have to look at refugee numbers more than asylum numbers on this. Um, and just to kind of close the loop on, on, on what, my, um, what Monica was saying is, aliens is actually a technical term. But you don't really hear people walking around saying about immigrants, oh, that person's an alien. Um, but in the law, we do use that term. It's actually a term that is on the forms that, that you fill out. Um, so in legal, you know, that's legal, that's legal jargon. That's legal jargon. That's not how we talk about people per se. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab that screen again um, because th th I think this, this chart is really fascinating. Um, I'm going to go back to the Refugee Project site. Michael, people are asking in the um, Q and A and the chat if you can share the um, the active links uh, of these uh, websites that you're sharing, so that they can look it up on their own. I can later. when other people are talking. <laughs> yes. Good. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I'll, I'll happily do that. I'm going to go back here to the uh, refugee project. So, one of the nice things about this pro th this site is you can literally go to any country and, and, and do this. So I could go to Russia and see how many refugees went to Russia, uh, China, how many went to China. Um, I, probably we're not going to see too many refugees. In, 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 well, we're back to the world now, uh, 2016. Let me do this. Um, I can get 2018 numbers here. And if I look at the data, you'll see, you'll be, I think you're going to be really surprised about where refugees are going. Um, look at this list. Uganda has more refugees in it than the United States. Uganda. Uh, to get to the United States, you have to go below China. So we're at what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16 or 17 in the world in the number of refugees uh, that, that, that have been resettled to our country. Now. That said, a lot of these places are land borders and, and, and refugee flows. People can walk there and they set up huge refugee camps, uh, typically run by the United Nations or other non-governmental organizations. A lot of churches do this. Um, in fact, uh, Vicki, you mentioned earlier a, a priest, a priest in Minnesota was helping on this, like this, this uh, underground railroad. Uh, well, that started down in Harlingen, a lot of them. And a lot of the a lot of the religious organizations were involved in in helping uh, helping the refugees uh, and, and intending immigrants find find sanctuary someplace in the United States, usually hopefully with family. But if they had to go all the way through and get to Canada, there was a lot of help there. And I have to find the name of the priest because I know that my wife, one of my wife's relatives, was part, one of the priests that was part of that underground railroad, and he lived in Minnesota, so maybe you know him. Um, <laughs> 
so anyway, I just here we can see the, the this this um, where refugees are, are resettling, and 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 to me, given the, given the amount of wealth we have in this country in general, um, I, I believe that we have the capacity to to do more refugee resettlement uh, in this country. I also would say part of my in my experience that people who resettle here. Uh, either the refugee process or through other uh, other immigration processes, tend to be um, they're 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 they are dedicated to making a better life for their families. Um, they're coming from difficult situations and they want to make a better life for their families. And almost everyone I knew who did this ended up owning a business, ended up maybe owning a whole si si bunch of businesses and, and hiring Americans and other other immigrants. Um, it, it, it's it's. I like to say that that that, ref, that, that immigrants uh, rejuvenate the American dream. Um, so uh, I'd like to see us move up this. All that to say that I'd like to see us, you know, up here somewhere. All right. I'm done with that one. <laughs> I might I might have gotten on a soapbox there a little bit. <laughs> Next question is, who are the illegal immigrant immigrants, quote, in the United States, and why don't they try to come here legally? Mm. Next question, what is the wait period for legal immigration for those who want to come here for a better life? So um, if, it, if, if we had a, 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 an immigration system that uh, worked, that worked better, um, I think that we would have, we would not see nearly the numbers of people arriving here uh, without, without documents, trying to cross the border in, in, in awful places or, or overstaying visas. But the process, the fact of the matter is our process is really, really difficult, folks. It is difficult. And um, I want to show you this real fast. There's a thing that, that's called the uh, United States Visa Bulletin. It comes out every month and it includes wait times. So if you are uh, if you are an unmarried son or daughter of a United States citizen and you're coming from Mexico, you're waiting 20 plus years to get a visa to enter the United States. 20 plus years. If you're in a different category, like a brother or sister, you're, 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 you're almost, regardless of the country, you're waiting 15 to 20 years. So the deal, the deal is that we have a system that was uh, that respected family immigration and family reunification, and the problem is that our process is so bogged down that it doesn't facilitate family reunification. It facilitates family separation. So uh, what I, what I would say is that the the reason you see people Entering, entering the country without authorization or overstaying is twofold. They're afraid to go back to their home country. They want to reunify, they want to, they, actually, I'm going to say threefold. They want a better life for them or their family, or they want to be unified. They want to be reunited with family who's here. So it's, it has to, a lot of it has to do with the length of time and the difficulty of the process. Um, and, and I think and we definitely want to comprehensive immigration reform has got to be on the top of the uh, top of uh, the United States agenda at some some time in the near future. All right, don't you move on to the next question. So, Michael, what is the immigration lottery and who thought of it? Is it still in use? So um, no, no, no stop, I'm not gonna screen share on this one. Um, there's a hit, real historical component to this. Um, if we go back to uh, one, of the, one of our earliest immigration laws, which was in 1924, it was based on a quota system. And the way the quota system was set up, they went back and looked at the census of 1890 and based the percentage of people, percentage of people who are allowed to enter from a country on that 1890 census. Well, the 1890 census um, was before you saw a lot of the uh, Italian immigration, a lot of immigration from from a, a lot of even parts of Southern Europe, 
Um, by 1890, most of our immigration had come from Northern Europe and, and Western Europe. So it was actually biased against Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans. But what we go further, this law actually said that um, immigration through slavery, they call them slave immigrants, were not eligible to be counted in the quota. So if you think about that, we didn't have very many African immigrants in 1890. The quota for African Im for immigrant immigration from Africa in, in, in 1924 was 1,100 people. Asians were specifically specifically um, disallowed for being included in the quota. And this is one of the most mind-boggling things for me: is um, Indians, uh, even even of, of Caucasian descent, were defined in this law as not white. And that so so to, that that carries forward to this day, to this day. Um, so, what am, where am I going with this diversity visa? We didn't have diversity in our immigration, and that's a that's a historical fact. Uh, so, what we ended up doing is uh, the diversity visa was a bipartisan, completely bipartisan in the, in the 1980s. It started with recognizing some European countries that, where we had low immigration and focused on. On, on, on bringing in folks from there. And then in 1990, the Immigration Act of 1990, this current diversity visa program was set up and, um, it, and, and, and it created opportunities for more folks from, from Africa, Asia, and other countries where we have, have had low immigration during the, during the decades, uh, in the, the last hundred years. Um, it is a program where everyone is fully vetted uh, they, they, there are certain requirements that have to be met, uh, like you can't, you can't enter the country and become a public charge, which means you, you're not going to be able to enter the country and take welfare. Um, so so there's, they, they have to go through all the full requirements uh, of people who are, who are applying for green cards and legal immigrant status. And it is still in use. It is still in use. Although last year, um, uh, they, they allowed in almost no people, even though it's 55,000 is the cap, they, it was less than 11,000 people that were admitted before the program was shut down um, due to COVID-19. Okay, so moving yeah. on, what is the main difference between former President Trump's philosophy of immigration and uh, current President Biden's, and what changes should we expect to see in immigration policies in the next three or four years? Well, so um, I, I, I will, uh, and I, I think that Chris will speak a little bit to this later. Pol immigration has always been very political and the treatment of immigrants has always been very political in, in our country. Um, and, so, and one of the things I worry about is trying to predict what will happen with immigration policy. I can look at um, pre President Biden's current proposal. And when I do that, I see that it is very, very different, starkly different from uh, President, President Trump's approach to immigration. Um, what President Trump um, did, a lot of it was, a lot of it was border, border enforcement, border control. Um, and then he wanted to really shift uh, to a kind of a more merit-based system. And you can see that in some other countries where there's this, you, you get points for being certain things. Like I'm, I'm 55 years old. I, I can't get points for my age anywhere. But uh, you know, if I were 25, so, and some of the students here, you, know, you get points in Canada because you're, because you're you know, under the age of 30. Um, so, so you have to accrue a certain number of points and then you can immigrate to a system. It tends to favor, it tends to favor the wealthy. Uh, in, in, in countries. So uh, that, that, that's what that system, it's a legitimate system used by other countries. I, I will say that, um, but our system has always been more, um, I would say empathetic and humane in that we've tried to do this family reunification and um, we've looked at helping refugees, asylees, being kind of a, a land, a land where people can make a better life. Um, and I would say that President Biden's uh, proposal moves in that direction. What will actually happen? I don't know. Um, he, he, he has, at least in the last few days, I've seen some comments where he prefers that things be done through a legislative process than an executive order process, which I frankly agree with, uh, because when you try to do things through executive orders, they can be reversed through executive orders. Statute, when, when something becomes law, it's, it's, it's better. So I, 
I appreciate that uh, it looks like President Biden will try to do this through having the immigration statute uh, updated. That will help, uh, that will give a lot of people um, a more solid foot on what they need to do to try to achieve their status in the United States. And um, he is supporting a pathway to citizenship. I will say that, which I think is great. Okay, so uh, that is the end of our questions. We thank you very much uh, for your thoughts, Michael. And we're going to move on to the panel portion of the program. And uh, our moderator, Joe Gullis Tego, will take over. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, this is my immigrant picture here. When uh, we first came here to this country, we, our, our passport was this type of passport. The whole family had to be there. And uh, this is me right in the, the top, uh, my two sisters, my mom, my dad came here earlier, but it's not about me, it's about talking about immigration and so forth. So now we're gonna look and talk to Anita. Anita, could you please talk to us about your experience? Yes, I'm excited to share with you all. Um, I'm moving things around a bit. Um, my goal here is to share a little bit about the psychological effects that impact children and families that come to America for a better life. We know that one of the most important psychological factors that is, is so pervasive is the idea of fear and fear negatively impacts both mental and physical health. It includes cardiovascular disease, immune dysfunction, and extended and extreme levels of fear actually enables chronic illness, depression, and anxiety to manifest. And what we find for these families and these children who come here is that fear releases stress hormones, and these stress hormones actually impede learning and long-term memory. Um, in the situations, fear is created because the biggest fear is the fear of being found out, we might say. We might say found out. Uh, shame actually underlies fear. And the shame is manifested in feelings of guilt and inferi inferiority. These feelings actually impede a sense of belongingness. And all of us need to feel a sense of belongingness. We know that belongingness uh, naturally occurs as we build relationships in the things that we do and the things that we say and the relationships that we build. But families coming here under these circumstances are afraid to talk about their families. They're afraid to talk about their siblings, their parents, their jobs they hold. And when they feel this way, the fear increases and the ability to feel a sense of belongingness is denied. And I need you to understand one thing, the fear never leaves it just either diminishes or increases according to the situations that happen. In fact, someone told me that fear is just a door knock away and that the lives can change. So what I wanted to talk about is how does it, the schooling situation impact these children and these families? So for example, in Northwest Indiana, when new families move to the area, parents first, the first thing they do is they complete a registration form and forms increase fear because families and parents have to report things that they are afraid will take away their children's future and their future. So forms immediately increase the fear that they experience. And registration forms for schools for US citizens are just factual. What are the names? What are the addresses? What are the birth, birth dates? What are the grades? Can we get the records? Do they have vaccines? But that's not the case for these families. And what happens is that they are afraid to be honest because of the consequences. And so, um, we know that they're just asked for their, their uh, name, their age, a previous school, 
and a city or state or country, and then the parent's name and signatures. Um, but they're asked two other questions. They're asked, what is the child's first language? And then they're asked, with which country do you identify? And, and this is where the reluctance comes in, to be honest, because, um, again, the fear of being removed from either the school or the city or the state or the country is, is such a real thing. The second thing is that parents are asked to show some form of identification. Um, in Northwest Indiana, I've spoken to some of the principals and they have told me that um, they don't uh, seek uh, US citizenship documentation. They ask for identification. If there's a green card, great. If there's not, they ask for identification such as um, like a, if they have a driver's license, that's great, but they even ask for identification that simply do they live in the area of the school district. So they'll ask for like um, a utility bill or a credit card statement that has the address. So um, they attempt, schools attempt to get birth certificates, but do uh, because of the missing children's laws, but sometimes this is very difficult as well. The second thing is another form, and this is, I believe, the saddest situation for, for families and students in schooling. They're asked to fill out something called a HOME, H-O-M-E, Home Language Survey. And it's basic information, as I mentioned before, but then it asks, what is the language most frequently spoken at home? And in what language would you like information from the school? Again, parents are reluctant to admit that the child's first language is something other than English, and they are afraid. The problem is that this particular form is a federal form, and it's how we get Title I funds so that we can uh, hire teachers to support their learning. So uh, in some cases, they're honest, and, and uh, I've talked to principals in you know, they may have indications of, of these families, but they don't, there's nothing that they are mandatory having to report if they can get the identification that they belong in the school district and that the children, birth certificates, that the children are their children. So um, I think that one of the things I wanted to talk about is that we have we have some national tests that have helped called the WIDA, which is world-class uh, innovation in instructional design and assessment. And, and uh, students can take that so we can ascertain um, their level of need. Um, one of the problems that we face is that we ask for uh, records uh, from their countries and we seldom get the records. So we don't know, we don't have any idea what the children's educational situation has been like and we also ask for vaccination records and we don't get those. I wanna tell you that there's five levels that we can actually get Title I funds for. And the highest level is a Title I teacher and they can be hired as an English language instructor that could actually teach in a full immersion classroom or they could teach in a bilingual environment. But the lowest level um, is actually just hiring an aide to pull out some students just to work with them. And it's said that children in this situation take three to five years of this kind of instruction and help before they can actually be in an effective instructional environment. And the one of the other things that is disheartening is that the teachers are not trying to teach them a one-to-one -one correspondence. For example, they can't show them a picture of a boat and put the American word and the Mandarin word or the Spanish word or the Filipino word. They can't because in the early grades, preschool, kindergarten, first, and even sometimes second grade, the children are illiterate in their own native language. And we, we, we ascertain some of those reasons, moving around, trying to get to a new place, a, a better place to live. There's absenteeism. And so, so we're not trying to, they're not even trying, they can't teach language 
shifts, they're actually teaching the basic, basic literacy skills is where they have to start. So we can see that there's a, a, a lot of issues. Um, lastly, the biggest, the second biggest issue is healthcare. And we know that families are afraid when their children become ill to seek health care. Um, again, they have to fill out documentation when they seek health care. Um, uh, they can't afford health care. They don't have health insurance. So oftentimes, even if children are ill, uh, the parents are reluctant to, to use health care uh, services. Um, I do want to say that it's these are the, the extreme cases. There's a, a varying range of cases, but I wanted to lay out the issues that we see facing, uh, facing the children and families. But I do wanna report on some good news. Um, parents from other countries and their children are the most grateful of all parents. I've had so many principals talk to me about how grateful they are and the joy that they feel that their child is actually being placed in a school, a strong school, and that the people are allowing them to have this opportunity for their child. And that brings them so much joy and happiness. And the second thing is that the parents feel a sense of pride in their child's learning. And this reiterates the fact that um, they, um, they're so thankful to all of the administrators and all of the instructors. And I think that what we really want to do with new administrations is we want regulations to be implemented that reduce the amount of fear associated with families and children's educational and healthcare opportunities. Affording greater achievement by students in shorter periods of time should be our goal. And we serve the children to the full extent that we can right now. And we dream of providing them with even more opportunities in the future. Thank you so much. So I'm going to uh, share a few thoughts um, now about the relationship between immigration and the economy and more specifically uh, economic justice. We, we can't um, ignore the fact that economics is deeply connected to the issues of immigration. Of course, in addition to the cultural and other social issues that are um, present and we are hearing about in the news on a regular basis. And so I, I wanna start by talking a little bit about the connection to economic justice. Um, and then I'm going to move to uh, provide a few facts on the contributions that immigrants do provide to the US economy and hopefully dispel some myths that are out there. You know, when I was listening to Michael and Anita speak, it is um, so clear that immigrants are put in a very vulnerable position from a social and legal perspective, but they are also put in a vulnerable position from an economic perspective as well. They can be the target of economic discrimination. Um, some of the examples that we see is that they are denied opportunities for work and or they are paid wages that are um, not aligned with legal requirements here in the United States. So I thought what I would do is just share a few facts with you out of studies that have been done on this particular issue. Um, there was a large survey of workers that were in low wage jobs in three major cities in the United States, in Chicago, New York, and LA. And just to note that these are all states that have very strong uh, labor laws in, in addition. And so when they looked at the um, unprotected workers, 26% um, of those workers are not being paid a minimum wage. 76% of the workers, immigrant workers, weren't paid overtime when they were actually working overtime. They found an average of uh, $51 difference in what they should be paid per week versus what they were actually paid. 
And there's a very low uh, percentage of those workers who do uh, apply for workers' compensation when in fact they are injured on the job. So right away we can see that in addition to the social and cultural uh, challenges that immigrants are facing when they do come here and they do even, are, when they are successful in moving into the labor force, they still have significant obstacles while they are actually contributing to, to the US economy. Um, if we look more specifically at women, almost 47% of all unauthorized women immigrants aren't paid the minimum wage and 85% aren't paid for their work over time. So it, it's even worse for female workers that are coming here to the United States. Um, these, we could, we could cite a number of different industries. Um, I will give you two examples, not to say that these are the only industries where some of these practices are taking place, but certainly um, the food industry, everything from uh, farm to table, uh, we are seeing that the service workers that are immigrant workers are actually being um, subject to what's called wage theft. Um, they, that increases their vulnerability. It puts them in, um, in crisis during times when they should be feeling more stable economic conditions. Um, and they also uh, don't always have the legal means to address these particular um, challenges in the economic environment, okay? Um, home workers is another area where this happens. Um, like I said, these are only two examples, but there are also, of course, other industries where we, where we find this. You may be familiar with a, a recent um, complaint that was filed by the Polish workers. Um, they were actually being paid as independent contractors out of Chicago instead of being paid as employees. And as a result, not only are they uh, paying the price of that. They don't have the benefits that they're entitled to. We find that the employers are actually uh, benefiting, which is, of course, why it's being done. They, they save on payroll taxes. They don't pay into the unemployment system and or the worker compensation system. So not only are those consequences for the, for the workers, they're also consequences for the overall economy. Um, we can talk about potential actions that people could take, but I think we'll leave that to the question and answer section. And I did want to end on a slightly, um, on a different note, on a positive note, so we can talk about the actual con economic contributions of the immigrants. Um, what, we, what we have here in the United States is um, a situation where there have been um, arguments made that immigrants take away jobs from the natives who are here in the United States. And in fact, research has shown that there's very little support for that view, that the inflows of the foreign labor um, have not in fact reduced jobs in the long run, and they've not reduced uh, American wages. In fact, the most recent evidence shows that American wages increased by about a half a percent because of the contributions of the immigrants. Um, there's also uh, an, an important economic concept called substitutes. And what we um, have realized through the studies is that immigrants are what we call, um, and it's a, it's a very technical term, right? We're not trying to humanize this at the moment. It's economic terminology. So immigrants are actually what we call imperfect substitutes. In other words, they don't directly compete for the same jobs that the native workers would be applying for in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases. And so what they found was that the competition actually affects prior immigrants more than it affects those who are native born because of the skill sets and the jobs that these individuals are, are moving into for many different reasons. And then finally, and very positively, immigrants are at the forefront of innovation and ingenuity. And we know that when we have innovation and ingenuity in the economy, that's positively correlated with economic growth, GDP growth and growth in our gross, gross domestic product. Um, they have the highest share of patent filings. They have the highest share of science and tech grads. They, are, they have the highest share of senior venture, venture capitalists. Um, and so the overall positive economic contribution um, is not only to the private sector, but also to the public sector, because in supporting all of those activities, they're actually supporting the um, tax base and the government's fiscal 
um, situation as well. So obviously we could spend a long time talking about all these issues. I've tried to give you a very quick overview, noting that um, economic justice cannot be separated from, uh, from immigration. And that part, I think, of the solution um, in thinking about reform and the directions that we need to move has to be attached to recognizing the positive contributions that these individuals are making in our economic system. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. I apologize, I was on mute when I, let me introduce uh, Christopher Young. Chris? Thank you, Joe. And if you could move to the next slide. Thank you. So when considering policy toward immigrants, um, we need to keep in mind context, both domestic and international. Uh, you know, immigrants, immigration, naturalization, it's not happening in a vacuum. Also, we wanna uh, be considering partisan politics and that partisan politics matter when we're talking about immigrants and the treatment of immigrants. Next, please. So for a few minutes, we're gonna talk about the 1790s. So as you can see from this image here, uh, this is, oh, go back, please, thank you. So here you have, uh, this is a, an etching from the Fifth Congress, and uh, it was a Federalist-controlled Congress. And we have, on the left, we have Congressman Matthew Lyon from Vermont. And on the right, we have Congressman Roger Griswold from Connecticut. And what happened here is that one insulted the other about their respective states. And then uh, a couple weeks later, uh, as a result of that, someone spit tobacco juice in another space. And of course, then, you know, uh, that led to what you're seeing right here where a cane and, uh, and tongs are involved. And, and they then eventually uh, fell to the ground and started to uh, uh, fight in, in earnest, even more so. So, but what you can see here with this etching um, perfectly illustrates is the partisanship and the polarization that was going on in the 1790s. And in many respects, you can see that it culminates in 1798 with the Alien Sedition Acts. And in the couple of minutes that we have here, I will focus on the Alien Acts. Next, please. So context matters. What's going on in the 1790s? So Right when the Constitution was ratified, there was a consensus. Uh, people felt pretty good. The political elites, I like to think of them, they are each giving you know, each other high fives. They did this, they pulled it off. It's great, everyone's happy. And then they began to talk about economic policy. This is where Hamilton begins to put his, his print on things. But more importantly, I think, was the French Revolution. And so when news of the French Revolution came, uh, to the United States, people were generally really happy about this because they thought that the United States had helped birth uh, freedom in Europe uh, with the French Revolution. So they were pretty excited about this. But in 1793, January 1793, when King Louis XVI was executed, this split American public opinion. And it really was timed perfectly because this is right when Americans were beginning to divide into different camps, what we would today call parties, they called factions. And so you have this robust discussion um, regarding uh, the appropriateness of the violence in France. Is it okay to execute a monarch? There's also domestic there's a domestic insurrection in Western Pennsylvania over federal taxes. 1796, you have a presidential election, very contentious between former friends John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, luckily for us later in life, they will, um, they'll have a reconciliation and they'll leave a wonderful correspondence. And so, but this election is really contentious because George Washington is not there. And he had been serving as a symbol of unity uh, for the United States. And it was someone that everyone for the most part uh, trusted, uh, but he was even falling victim to the, to the polarization at the time. So. Uh, 1796, the election is very contentious. John Adams is elected president. Thomas Jefferson's elected vice president. Back then, what happened, who came in first was president, who came in second was vice president. George Washington's cabinet was retained. To kind of throw another uh, uh, problem here, why didn't John Adams have his own cabinet? 
while things were just so new, he didn't realize he could do that. Uh, so he didn't. So he kept a cabinet on that was not loyal to him. It was actually loyal to Alexander Hamilton. So you have the split within the Federals, which I'll get to in a moment. Also at this time, and you get into 96, 97, 98, there's this increased tension with France that was a result um, of a treaty between the United States and Great Britain. So you have this tension with France and there's this fear of invasion. And the Federalists believed that the Republicans would assist with the invading French army in 97, 98. And on top of all this, in Philadelphia, which is where the capital was at the time, between 1790 and 1800, that was the seat of the US government, you have a yellow fever epidemic during four of those years. Next, please. And besides context, and actually part of the context, it's a partisan politics at the time. So you have two parties in the 1790s. You have the Federalists led by Adams and Hamilton, and you have the Republicans led by Jefferson and Madison. Each of the parties identified with the, the superpowers at the time, with Great Britain and France. You see some of this going on in the Cold War as well, um, much later. You have the XYZ affair, which leads to the war fever that I had just been talking about. And with the XYZ affair, what you have going on here is that because there was this quasi war going on, Adams sent three diplomats uh, to France to negotiate a peace. When they arrived, the operatives, the French operatives said, you need to pay a bribe before you, we'll even begin talking about uh, peace, before we even negotiate. And the Americans said, forget it, we're leaving. So they came back and the Republicans said, oh, this is just, you know, what you're trying to do is create a war with France because it will be, it'll turn the populace against the Republicans. This never really happened. We demand, said the House Republicans, we demand to see these papers. John M says, all right, fine, we'll show you the papers. And sure enough, in those dispatches, it showed that these operatives, it, they call it XYZ affair, but in the papers, it's WXYZ. These operatives actually did what the diplomats said they did. It was a huge embarrassment uh, for the House Republicans. And of course, it increased now that the news was really out um, about, uh, you know, so people were gearing up for war. But this, this is an example of the polarization and the distrust that they demanded to see these papers. They thought it was a scam on the part of the president. They didn't believe them. And what you have here is a polarization, you have distrust, you have the demonization of the others and their supporters. In this context, in this highly charged partisan context, the Federalists then moved to enact laws to restrict pro-Republican immigrants and speech. And these laws are called the Alien and Sedition Acts. Next, please. So for our purposes here today, I'm just going to give an overview of the Alien Acts of 1798. So the Alien Acts uh, made up of three acts, as you can see here. The Naturalization Act of 1798 increased the residency requirement to 14 years from five years. So many of the new immigrants that were coming, they were mainly coming from some were landowners in Haiti, but you also had people coming from France, but especially Ireland. And those uh, that were coming from Ireland were pro-Republican, they were pro-French Revolution, and this made the Federalists very nervous. And so they moved to, um, uh, to, to, to make it where they would not be voting in the upcoming election. So they, they changed the requirement from 14 years to five years. So it had been in, set in the Naturalization Act of 1790, it was three years. The Naturalization Act of 1795 made it five years. And then the Naturalization Act of 1798 made it 14 years. So then you also have the Alien Enemy Act. And what the Alien Enemy Act did was it permitted the government to arrest and deport all male citizens of an enemy nation in the event of a war. And in fact, this law is still on the books. And it was amended in 1918 to include women. Then there was the Alien Friends Act, which allowed the president to deport any non-citizen suspected of plotting against the government, even in peacetime. Um, Adams never invoked this. Next, please. So why does this all matter and so what? What it shows is that 
there is always a political uh, context to the treatment of immigrants, both domestic and international. So whenever we're looking at what's going on with immigrants, um, we need to also consider, you know, what is the context? And also that immigrants get caught up in the web of partisan politics, unfortunately. Thank you. All right. Um, I have here, how can uh, people get involved in the fight uh, for justice for immigrants? And roll. So uh, if I if I take that one, um, when my my first job uh, that I described earlier down at the Rio Grande uh, border, there were lots of volunteers that helped us uh, that that would go out to the detention center visiting. Uh, you had a detention center in, in, in Chicago Chicago land. Um, so there are organizations that are committed to this. You could you, you could look at, at, at look for organizations that are committed to mi migrant justice, and and you could work with them. I mean, that would be the the easiest way to do it. I, I okay. I have um I have uh, I have from Jeannie. Uh, she says I will uh, I volunteer with the the Welcome in Northwest Indiana North Network in Northwest Indiana. There is a great organization in our area, like Indiana Consider, an attractive area for immigrants to come uh, to. So there we have one. Uh, another one is, uh, and what are the steps? Uh, let me see here. If you, if you're with a client from the start to finish, what is the start and end, uh, and what is the finish? That's a different story for every single client. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but it, basically, um, you always, always have to do a very thorough uh, intake with, with your client, meaning there's a lot of uh, conversation. Um, some, some legal organizations will have paralegals do that, and, and they'll have like very in-depth uh, intake forms where they ask and, and get, and get uh, questions, and then they can filter out cases that the, that the attorneys might be interested in. Um, and a, as a solo practitioner, I always just met with people and talked to them to try to figure out what their situation was. And from there, um, it, 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 th then we would talk about strategy and, and what's realistic. And um, so, you know, every case is really different, though. Uh, honestly, my, my favorite ones are the ones where um, I work with somebody, they get their green card. Sooner or later, I can work with them on naturalization. They could become citizens and I get to go see them get sworn in and we all cry <laughs> because it's awesome. <laughs> I, I have another one here from Mike Quetis from WDEC NPR. Uh, given Indiana's right leaning politics, is Indiana considered an attractive area for immigrants to come to? How can Northwest Indiana's more established Latino community do to aid Latino immigrants? It's a question for everyone here. Yeah, I'd say that's a question for everyone um, because uh, I think different parts of Indiana are very different too. There's a pretty pretty big immigrant community in, in Indianapolis. I can guarantee you that. And um, like I'm going out playing soccer with with people from all over the world. You know, most weekends. Well, well, back before COVID, I was doing that. <laughs> well, and also I think in our adjunct in Spia, we do proactively actually work with uh, many of our. Uh, immigrants uh, from other countries that come to Indiana University in the Northwest. So we had that capability. So Mike went to say, if you want to, please reach out to us and we can try to work together with you. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Are there any other questions from the panel that we could address too? All right. Let me see here. What is the number allowed in the into the United States per year for whatever reason? I guess immigrants, that's what they're talking about. But I have here, what is the number of, of immigrants allowed into the United States per year for whatever reason? Okay, so immigrants, um, it's averaged around a million. There are not limits in some categories, but th that's kind of not really the way it works out. So it's been about a million. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, Professor Zarlata, I think I have that right, was talking about economics. The fact of the matter is um, we have so many people stepping out of the workforce right now that we could probably stand to have about uh, 2 million more than that per year to, to come in to help support our economy. 
that's just my my perspective on it. But if you look at the numbers of people supporting Social Security, they're going down, 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 and uh, we have more and more people retiring. So uh, we need we need people. We really do. All right. Um, and I'll just add that uh, the latest figures show that um, the immigrants that are coming in are of uh, most of the immigrants, the majority of the immigrants are of working age. So they're making the contributions to the social security and other systems. So. Do, uh, I know the Indiana University Northwest has some uh, organizations within the university to reach out to the community, Latinos and immigrants. How many are there? Does anyone know organizations with that are uh, minority center immigrants, like Chinese? We have Indian uh, students that need to be uh, get reach out to. So I'm trying to find some other questions here. So, okay. so Joe, Joe, one of, one of the things that I've really experienced a lot is. Um, Local church organizations are just incredibly connected with their communities. And uh, I, when I was in Philadelphia, um, I, I would frequently drive down to Georgetown, Delaware, which is about two hours south at, at the tip of the peninsula down there. And it was a huge Guatemalan community there. And it was the church that got in contact with Catholic Social Services and said, can you send someone down here to talk to people down here? Um, so that's a great way to find out if 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 there's um, people who need some support. I, I mean, I, I I know we talked about fear with the uh, filling out forms, but one of the census part of the problem that they had this time was actually filling out the census that were that was very important to them, and it becomes a very difficult part for immigrants to take. Uh, what kind of information is out there to lessen that fear. Anita? Your volume. Well, she's playing my role here. I put myself in mute a while ago. Anita, can you put your volume up? There you go. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, I'm not familiar with um, that particular form because I work with the schools, but I would suggest that if they are uh, people who are coming here who are not citizens, and do not have documentation that the fear increases in any form where they have to give private information that would allow someone to come and remove them from where they are, ICE, for example. Mm -hmm. I don't know if someone else has other information about that specific thing, but the fear still exists and it increases by that form. I, 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 this, this is one of the most worrisome things about being an immigration attorney is people getting bad information and bad information becoming the information that spreads throughout the community. And so what, what people have to do is they really need to go to attorneys or nonprofit legal organizations that specialize in immigration work. Because if they don't, they'll find attorneys that don't understand immigration. If they don't, they'll find community members who say, that, oh, they've worked with a lot of people and they don't have accurate information. Um, so immigrants are, they, they are, they are in danger of getting bad information. And, 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 and you know what? Sometimes that could lead to being deported for the rest of your life. So it's, people do have to be careful. Stick with the lawyers. There, there are lists out there um, of people who are, are, you know, are recommended by national organizations. There's one called American Immigration Lawyers Association that maintains an attorney list. Um, even the immigration courts have a, have a, a nonprofit list for reduced reduced costs legal services is there any way we could uh, uh, get that information through the internet uh, Michael yeah okay. yeah I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send I'll send it to Monica uh, you know one of the things that uh, working as uh, for Indiana University of Cal School of Business they used to send us out during the census to attract the fastest growing minority which is in this case was the Latinos that they some of them were not registered and in going into areas rural areas where they were working undocumented and to get them to fill out those forms in the fear that they had just coming out to talk about it. That was something that uh, it's a very important. That's why the fear is there. 
Yeah, uh, I wanted to mention real quick is that also we're, we're dealing with language barriers and we're dealing with nuances of language. When they hear the word lawyer, they think of the law. And so I think that fear steps in in multiple avenues, not just for fear of being um, removed, but just talking to a lawyer. It is fearful because it has to do with the law. So I think it's the nuances of language and the not understanding of how there are lawyers that could actually support their cause. We have a radio station WLTH that is Latino orientated and the, you talk about the language barrier or the languages. If you call a Hispanic or Latino licenciado, that's lawyer. And translate it. And so they think you're a lawyer and you try to tell them, no, I'm not a lawyer. I don't profess to be one. And so it, it becomes pretty tough and there's fear, but there's happiness that you're well informed to help them out in so many things. So you're, you're right. The fear is constantly out there. And I think trust, I think Michael said it is trust. They don't know who to trust. Ellen, in, in regards to the economy uh, in Northwest Indiana, or in rural areas, how has the immigration been impacted? Is it worse in the state of Indiana or parts around our neighborhood, neighboring states? Um, you know, that's a very good question, Joe, and I would um, have to look into it and get some facts before I could make a conclusive statement about it. But, you know, I think that we can, um, if we look, just generally at the topic, I don't think we would say that the issues that the immigrants are facing are isolated to a particular state. I mean, as, as a survey was done in Chicago, Los Angeles and New York uh, pointed out, it, those are very strong labor law states uh, where protections are afforded enforcement tends to be stronger too. And so those, the immigrants are facing um, work theft issues, uh, work discrimination issues, racial, racial discrimination issues, et cetera, in those circumstance, circumstances. I don't have the figures for Indiana, so I can apologize. I apologize, but I could certainly look it up and get that information out to people. Monica, did you have something to say? I wanted to say that there are so many important questions in the uh, Q&A, but also in the chat. And um, it seemed to me that we have uh, community organizers working with us today, uh, attending the program. We also have activists um, and I love the passion and the energy. And I want people to um, connect with us because we are planning other events. And I think we need more voices uh, at the table. Uh, we need to hear from the community what is actually going on. I hear the concern about the um, uh, farming workers, and this is a, a concern in, uh, nationwide. They are not protected, um, but we need them um, desperately. Uh, but um, even under COVID, they have been the least protected group, and um, many of them um, reported uh, uh, in a program um, published by uh, Frontline, uh, that they, they felt com uh, co uh, obligated to go to work even when they were sick, which caused enormous issues among um, uh, people working in the community. So there are so many other um, uh, issues and questions that we need to address that we won't have the time to address all of them. But I am particularly, um, uh, I'm really touched by the interest that the community and the students and everybody attending this program is uh, manifesting. So I make a promise that we're gonna continue doing these programs um, and gather more information. Um, I also see that there is a, a particular interest in understanding what's going on in Northwest Indiana in the community. Um, the protests that are going on at the Gary Airport uh, um, against the detention of refugees or even uh, um, years ago, I remember um, there was a, um, a questionable move of whether we should build a detention center um, in Northwest Indiana or not. So all these are very important points. Um, there were uh, other questions that, that um, referred uh, specifically to the economy and the well-being of the families. Um, and maybe we can give priority to those uh, uh, next time around. 
um, so I want to uh, say thank you to everybody who attended and I want to say thank you uh, to Michael Morone who is a professor uh, at U Bloomington. I took the time today to join um, SPIA and the University Northwest. I want to say thank you to all the uh, panelists um, and the host and the moderators, Susan and Joe Gomusego. Um, if there is any uh, last burning question, uh, please go ahead and ask uh, now um, in the chat or the last comments. Uh, the um, presentation will be, uh, the event will be available as recording uh, through the IU uh, Northwest uh, YouTube uh, channel that the marketing um, will uh, make available. Um, so I guess I want to say I miss you all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and until uh, next time, uh, take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Michael and Anita and Ellen and Susan Sinner and Chris and uh, our Vice Chancellor, uh, Linda uh, and uh, Monica. So much thankful and grateful for what this program is going to be doing in our community. Thank you. Thank you.